Welcome to your Child's Health University lecture this evening. I'm Nancy Sanchez, and it's my great pleasure this evening uh, to introduce to you Dr. Megan Imry, who is an assistant clinical professor of pediatric orthopedic surgery uh, for Stanford School of Medicine and Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Dr. Imry is a graduate of Yale University and the University of California San Diego School of Medicine and she did her residency um, at Stanford wherein she received the Resident Research Award. Her many interests and in research areas include scoliosis, fractures, and other common pediatric orthopedic issues. Now tonight, Dr. Emery will address the prevalence of back issues in children. Uh, many of us, myself included, uh, often presume that adults are the people who are most pl plagued with back issues, but in fact, Dr. Emery is here to um, tell us about when children have back issues, about uh, a variety of diagnoses and treatments for back issues. Um, we want you to know that this presentation is being taped. There will be a question and answer period afterwards that will not be taped, and it will be available for you to view on the Packard Children's website uh, within a couple of months. So um, thank you, Dr. Emery, for giving us your time, and, and welcome. Thank you guys so much, and uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, so tonight I'll be speaking on uh, back pain and back problems in children, uh, which are not as rare as uh, we once thought. Uh, I have a sort of minimum number of slides, because I thought we could do things uh, a little bit more interactive, but we'll just go ahead and proceed and stop me if you have any questions. Uh, we always talk about disclosures in uh, orthopedic surgery. My only disclosure is that I tend to talk fast, so I'll do my best to slow it down. So tonight we'll go over uh, sort of the scope of the issues, possible diagnoses and treatments. Uh, I think there's a lot of concern among parents and uh, schools about back pain uh, and the association with backpacks. So we'll touch on that briefly. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about what few preventative, uh, preventive measures uh, there are. All right. So starting with the scope of the problem, back pain in kids, which I'll define as uh, uh, people less than 18 years old is much more common than we previously thought. So our traditional teaching in orthopedic surgery and still in some of our textbooks today uh, it says that kids don't get back pain. If you have a child who is complaining of back pain, there must be something seriously wrong with them, like a tumor or an infection uh, or something along those lines for them to be manifesting uh, pain. But it turns out that that's not really the case uh, anymore. There have been a myriad of studies done in the literature demonstrating this uh, with prevalence rates of back pain in uh, patients less than 18 years old, ranging anywhere from about 36% to upwards of 80%. And again, in the past, we used to think that there was a very identifiable cause for back pain in a child, that if your child had uh, pain in their back, that there was a diagnosis that we could find, address, and treat. Uh, and that also is no longer the case. Uh, so a specific cause is only found about 20% of the time. And the majority of the time, uh, unfortunately, we don't know exactly what causes back pain. Just like in adults, most of the time, we really don't know what causes back pain. We do know that the frequency of back pain increases with increasing age. So again, there have been many studies looking at this. I quoted a few of them here, uh, which is for seven-year-olds, the rate is 1%. 6% for 10-year-olds, 18% for 14-year-olds. Uh, another study said 11% at 11 uh, and 50% at 15. I like that one just because it's easy to remember, <laughs> easy to quote. Uh, and then another that said 5% at age 6 and 84% at age uh, 16. And the numbers don't necessarily matter as much as just the general trend that there's an increasing frequency that the older uh, patients get. And the Differing rates depend a little bit on how the study is done, how the question is asked, how the patients are evaluated, that sort of thing. So that's really where that range comes from. As opposed to adults, many children don't seek medical uh, evaluation for their back pain. Uh, so in adults, it's the second leading reason for a visit to a doctor's office. And I was actually talking with a patient's parent today, mentioning that I was going to be giving this lecture. He's also um, a physician. And he said that every Ford car $1,500 of the price of the car goes towards uh, health care for the worker, and of that $1,500, $500 is for back pain itself. So it's a huge issue in adults, a huge um, presentation to our medical resources, but in children, not as much. Fewer children seek medical evaluation. 
In addition, many children forget that they ever had an episode of back pain, so it doesn't necessarily have those lasting effects that it may in an adult. And finally, there is, for most patients, no Im negative impact on the quality of life questionnaire. So we come up with these questionnaires that we give to patients to try to figure out how the condition that they're being treated for affects their quality of life. And we try to um, validate these questionnaires and, and make sure we're asking the right questions in the right ways. Uh, and so there have been studies that show that unless the back pain is associated with kind of whole body pain, that there's no real difference in the average quality of life of patients with back pain as opposed to those that don't. And this is within the adolescent population. So the question is, why are we seeing this increase in back pain? And I think that we don't really know the answer, um, but there are a few things that are interesting at least to think about. So one is the increased rate of obesity. So we all know that our country is becoming increasingly uh, obese, both in the adult population and unfortunately trickling down to our uh, pediatric population as well. And it's well known that obesity is associated with increased risks of pain in general, both in adults and children, but specifically of back pain. So that may be one reason. Another may be that we're uh, in the Western uh, hemisphere, and specifically in the United States, and I'd say also especially in California, are leading more sort of uh, computer-based, sedentary, quote-unquote, comfortable lifestyles. And so we tend to be hunched over at computers or hunched over our iPhones or iPads or um, smartphones or tablets, not to give it a specific brand. Uh, so, you know, I sort of say in tongue in cheek, is this eye back pain? Mm -hmm. Unclear. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, there is a study of Mozambican adolescents, so Mozambique, a country in Africa, where they looked at uh, children living in the wealthier urban center versus sort of a um, suburban area versus the rural area. And to make their numbers um, more powerful, they combined the sort of peripheral kids with the rural kids and compared those to the uh, wealthier urban center uh, children. And what they found is that the uh, living in the wealthier urban center was associated with a threefold increased risk of back pain. So there's something maybe about being more sedentary or being, uh, you know, having your water come out of the tap and have your food in the grocery stores that you can spend your time not necessarily taking care of your absolute most basic needs, but doing other things, and that that may be somehow associated with an increased rate of back pain. And interestingly, the wealthier urban center rates in this study were similar to Western industrialized nations. So there may be something there. On the other hand, we're sort of conversely leading a more active lifestyle in a sense, meaning that, uh, and I talked about this in my lecture last fall, I guess, has it really been that long? Whoa. Uh, about sports and the increased uh, prevalence of specialization in sports at a younger age. So kids are doing baseball for school, a travel league, a club league, and, and really playing the same sport all year. And that that necessarily isn't good for a growing skeleton. And so if you're doing just the same sport over and over all year, you're not really giving your back a break, nor your knees or ankles or whatever specific muscle is, is stressed by that particular sport. So then again, kind of tongue in cheek, is this line back pain? Or... And then the question of backpacks I'll address separately. Uh, and then also the question is, is it because we have better access to health care? So now that more children are thankfully seeing doctors, are they saying, oh, you know, I'm going to the doctor and oh, my back kind of hurts, so maybe I'll mention it. And then it's our onus to figure out why and try to treat it, et cetera, et cetera. So that may be a reason as well that we're seeing an increased rate uh, of back pain. Maybe it's just increased reporting, that it's always been the same rate, but now we're just asking or patients are telling us in, uh, in this venue. So finally, it's important to note that um, back pain is just common, unfortunately, especially uh, in adults, and that nearly 80% of adults will experience back pain at some point in their lives. And so is this kind of a rite of passage? Do you get your driver's license? Do you vote? Do you drink? Do you experience back pain? Is that just part of becoming an adult? And it's unclear. So moving on, if there are any questions about scope? Nope, OK. So let's talk about that 20% of the time when we do find a diagnosis, what that can be. And this will by no means be an exhaustive list, but just some of the key things to touch on. So like I said, most of the time we can't find a specific cause, only 22% 20, 20, of the time in our most recent studies. Uh, and there are things that we as doctors uh, pay attention to and ask when a patient presents with back pain uh, that we call red flags or things to worry about that make us think, oh, there may be a specific cause and let me work this up a little bit further. 
And those red flags are night pain. And night pain is defined as uh, pain that wakes a child up from sleeping. So not that they have an ache in their back or an ache in their knees and can't quite fall asleep or needs a little Advil or a little massage or something to get to sleep, but this is pain that wakes you up from a deep sleep and it's the pain that woke you up. Not you woke, you, you woke up because you had to pee and you noticed that you had pain at the same time. Constant pain, so pain even at rest. No you know, change in position doesn't affect it at all. Time of day doesn't affect it all. It's just all the time in the same exact spot. That would be constant pain. Pain in young children, uh, so less than eight uh, is, if you remember from the scope of the problem, that it's fairly rare to have back pain less than uh, 10. Uh, so if you're less than eight, and specifically if they stop playing, uh, so it's not just back pain when you're going to the grocery store or running your errands, and all of a sudden, Jimmy's back's like, oh, I can't come with you, mom, because my back hurts. It's, you know, everybody in the neighborhood's playing. Usually they'd be run out, running out, kicking the soccer ball in the neighborhood, but because of their back, they're not participating in those activities. That's a red flag for us. Of course, any constitutional symptoms, we call them, so any fevers, weight loss, lethargy, uh, change in their mood or uh, energy level, all of those can be concerning. And then if there are any associated symptoms, so not just what they are describing, but what you can actually observe. So is a patient limping? Uh, have they lost bowel or bladder continence? Can they no longer control their urine or their stool? Uh, and if they're complaining of any radicular symptoms we call, so that's pain that radiates into the leg, uh, either pain or numbness or tingling or certainly any weakness. So this is, not again, not an exhaustive list, but these are sort of the main things that we key into as possible red flags uh, that we would trigger a more extensive workup. And then it's important to know that it's not always the back, that the back pain could be a red herring of something else, that, that the pain uh, or the problem could be elsewhere and just referring pain to the back. And specifically, uh, UTIs is a pretty common one. So your kidneys are, sorry for the microphone, right here on each side of your back. So, you know, kids didn't take an anatomy lesson. When we define back as the spinal column, they don't necessarily know that. So they might say, oh, their back hurts, but really they're pointing to their flank, and that's where your kidneys are. And so if you have a pyelonephritis, which is from a bad UTI, that could present as back pain. Abdominal disorders such as appendicitis, pancreatitis can refer to the back. Ovarian cysts in young girls can sometimes refer to the back. So, you know, it's not always coming from the back itself. It could be uh, someplace else and just referring there. Uh, and your pediatrician can help ask the right questions in this differential. These things are usually fairly acute. So it's not that it's been going on for six months and this is what you have. It's usually within a couple of days, you know, you're gonna be getting worse. And so the diagnosis is gonna become fairly obvious over time, over a short period of time. So, <coughs> excuse me. Some of the things that it can be and that we all worry about and the things that go bump in the night are extremely rare but include certain tumors, uh, both benign, meaning they don't spread anywhere else, they just stay in their location and cause uh, pain, or malignant where they spread elsewhere. Benign conditions include uh, that top uh, picture, actually both of these pictures. The top picture is an osteoid osteoma. Uh, it's a um, basically normal little bit of bone, almost like a pebble in your shoe. It's a little bit of normal bone uh, in otherwise normal bone that's just inflammatory for some reason and causes night pain specifically. Very easily relieved with non anti-inflammatories and very treatable. When we take out the nidus, that's what that little bone is called or the pebble in your shoe. When we take that out, patient's pain is almost immediately improved. We can also uh, do fancy things like ablate it with radio frequency and basically kind of burn it out. But so this is one thing that would cause that traditional night pain that wake, wakes a patient from sleeping. The other picture is of what's called an aneurysmal bone cyst. This is again a benign condition where the bone uh, expands and becomes cystic, almost like a balloon kind of blowing up, and that can present in the back as well. Leukemia, again, especially in younger patients, less than eight or 10, can present as kind of persistent uh, back pain. And that's worked up very easily with a, a CBC or a blood count usually. And then infections, uh, not super common, but also not super rare. So we, we see infections not infrequently, and they can infect the spine as well, both the disc space or the space in between the bones, as well as the bones themselves. Uh, tuberculosis has a strong affinity for the spine, and we don't see that that often in this country, but it's definitely seen uh, very commonly in other parts of the world where tuberculosis is a little bit more uh, common. So some more common things when we find the answer, what is the answer? Uh, one of them is spondylolysis. So it's a nice 
fancy word uh, that uh, basically means uh, crack through the spine. So spondy is spine and lysis is crack. And this is basically a stress fracture of a certain part of the back that we call the pars articularis, which the picture on the top left, the black line is where the crack is. So basically your spinal uh, column, if you think about it, you have the vertebral bodies in the front that basically provide the main structure and support of your whole body. That's in the front here. And then you have the spinal canal, which is this, this central space. That's where your spinal cord and then nerve roots come through. That is here. And then these are the posterior elements, the pedicles and the lamina and then the facet joints. And that's basically like the roof over your spinal canal that helps protect your spinal cord and your nerve roots from any bumping in the back. And then that's all connected with ligaments so that you have uh, overall stability, supported by muscles, etc. So a spondylolysis is a stress fracture through one of the connections to go from one vertebral body to the other, basically through the lamina, we call it. It's almost always in the lumbar spine or your lower spine. And it's thought to be due, from, due to re, uh, repetitive microtrauma from hyperextension. So especially in athletes who do a lot of arching back, <coughs> excuse me, like gymnasts, divers, dancers, uh, linemen in football, you know, they're always bracing up against somebody as they come off the, uh, the line. It's not football season, so I'm forgetting my vocabulary, but uh, they're always kind of being pushed into hyperextension, so it's very common in them as well. And this is usually low back pain with activity, often exacerbated by that extension because you're really loading uh, that area. And it can radiate into the buttocks and legs, although it doesn't always. Now, interestingly, spondylolysis uh, occurs in 3 to 6% of the population. So that's a, a pretty high number when you think about it. But only a few of those patients are actually symptomatic. So not everyone is symptomatic. Uh, we also don't see it in very young children, uh, so it's something that develops over time. You're not born usually with a spondylolysis. Uh, it happens uh, uh, from whatever activity you're doing. And then we also don't see it in uh, animals who walk on all fours. So there's some conditions that we see both in the human and animal population, and this is one that we don't. So it must be somehow related to walking in an upright posture and having that sort of lordosis in the lumbar spine or the arching of the lower back. In terms of what we do about it, the mainstay of treatment is non-operative. Uh, the pictures here show a CT scan of a patient who had a unilateral spondylysis, or it was only on one side of the crack. That's the picture in the top on the left. And then subsequently, they developed a crack on the other side, developed a bilateral spondylolysis. So that's what those black lines are there. Those are the cracks through the bone. Uh, so our treatment is usually, most importantly, rest from the exacerbating activity. So it was probably the repetitive hyperextension that caused it. So the way to hopefully help it heal is to stop doing the exacerbating activity. That's very hard for patients, very hard for families, because these are usually pretty active kids, love doing sports, want to keep doing sports, and we tell them that they really have to shut it down, and for a long time, because it takes many, many months, usually, for this to go away. A lot of times we'll recommend physical therapy for core strengthening. Occasionally we'll recommend bracing, just to really help decrease movement uh, across the area. Or, to be honest, sometimes if a patient just really either has a coach or a personality that they just can't shut it down, the brace will shut it down for them. Sort of an outward manifestation to say, listen, I have a broken bone in my back. i got to stop what I'm doing. The most important thing is probably patience, because it does take a while. And it's important to know, and I always counsel my patients and their families, uh, to know that a lot of times the fracture doesn't heal. So the fracture develops, is inflamed and painful. Uh, and for our treatment, we shut it down, build up their core muscle strength, the pain goes away. But many times, it's not because the fracture is healed, but because it's just become not symptomatic anymore. And remember that 3 to 6% of the population has this. So having it in and of itself does not mean that you have symptoms, if that makes sense. Uh, so it's kind of a weird thing to wrap your head around that sort of a cure or healing of this is not radiographic healing, but rather how you're doing from your symptom standpoint. And there's no significant association after you're done growing with a persistent spondylolysis leading to any problems down the line. So you think, oh, especially if I have bilateral, I've got two cracks, you know, one on each side of the spine, doesn't that make my spine unstable? 
and I'll talk about spondylolisthesis in the next slide, which is sort of related, where there's some slipping of the vertebral bodies, one on the other. Um, but that only develops uh, when patients are younger and growing. So if you're done growing, you have a bilateral spondylolysis that's asymptomatic, it's extremely unlikely that's going to progress to an unstable condition when you're older. So we're really just going for symptomatic improvement. And very rarely, we'll treat these with surgery. So if a patient has tried a good six to 12 months, uh, usually of non-operative treatment, then we'll proceed with surgery if they're still having pain. And either we try to get the bone to heal, we sort of fix the crack, uh, or we'll fuse the segment. So if you have an L5 spondylolysis, especially if it's bilateral, many times we'll just fuse L5 and S1 together, so we'll make the bones grow together. Because it's hard to get this bone to heal, both without surgery and with surgery. And fusing one segment of the spine has very low morbidity, meaning that we're not taking much away from a patient, and we have a much higher chance of success. So it depends on where it is and what the patient's like, what the fracture's like, but these are usually our two options, either fixing it or fusing the uh, segment. So I mentioned that I'll talk about spondylolisthesis. It's another fancy Greek word, spondylos, still meaning spine, and listhesis meaning slippage. So this is basically one vertebral body slipping on the other. The picture up at the top left uh, is a lateral of the spine. So if you looked at your spine from this way, one of those vertebral bodies is slipping on the other. We see this in adults for different reasons, arthritis of the facet joints and some other things. But in kids, it usually falls into one of two categories, uh, either related to spondylolysis, spondylolysis or an isthmic spondylolisthesis, where the pars, or that lamina, is elongated for some reason. They're kind of born with an elongated bone. So they still have an intact posterior arch. The roof is still connected to the house, so to speak, but it's just much longer. Uh, and uh, again, so this can be either through the pars fracture or through the elongated pars. If the roof is intact, if you have an isthmic spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis, you're more likely to have some nerve symptoms because the roof is still on the house and it's sort of being dragged forward. So it might put pressure on the nerve roots, which then causes pain where those nerves go, buttock, leg, et cetera. The treatment is based on severity of the slip. We have a grading system. If it's 0 to 25% of the width of the vertebral body, 25 to 50, 50 to 75. Details are a little bit inconsequential. But basically, if it's a small slip, then you'll probably do fine. We treat you symptomatically, just like if you had only a spondylolysis or uh, some activity-related back pain. But we'll probably follow you with x-rays if you're still growing to make sure it doesn't slip more. Or if you have a severe slip, then we'll usually recommend surgery. And the picture x-ray there shows what we call a spondyloptosis, where one vertebral body actually completely falls off the other. Uh, so it looks crazy. It looks like you shouldn't be able to walk around with the back looking like that. Uh, but we do see patients uh, who are like that with very minimal neurologic symptoms because it's happened slowly over time. So that's spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis. I'd say uh, in my practice, uh, when I do find a diagnosis for back pain, this is the most frequent one. So the tumors, the infections, those are all extremely rare. But spondylolysis, uh, when we do find the diagnosis, this is probably the most uh, frequent uh, cause that I find. Although lately I've been having a run of disc herniations. So disc herniations you hear a lot about in the adult population. We do also see these in uh, children, but usually in the adolescent uh, population. So when they're making that transition, at least skeletally, not necessarily maturity-wise, uh, into adulthood. And similarly, there's something called an apophyseal fracture, uh, which if you look at the picture uh, down uh, the bottom, you see the disc and then what's called the end plate and the physis or the growth plate. So each vertebral body, each one of those squares in the front part of your spine, you have a growth plate when you're growing on either end that's next to the disc above and below. And in the growing skeleton, the weak point is the growth plate. Uh, so your, your ligaments and your tendons and everything else is stronger than your growth plate. So whereas when your growth plate's closed, you may get a disc herniation. When you're younger, the same sort of injury or episode may cause a little bit of the um, the end plate uh, or a slip through the growth plate where a little bit of bone comes off with the disc. So it's sort of similar, but just happens at a different location, depending on if your growth plate is open or closed. So for a disc herniation, both in adults and children, has a fairly favorable natural history, meaning that if left alone, the vast majority of these will get better because the body sort of chews up that little bit of disc that's 
splooged out into the uh, spinal canal. The body absorbs it over time, but it can take up to two years. It takes a long, long time for it to go away. So our treatment is geared towards, can you tolerate the symptoms that you currently have while nature takes its course? its course? So how bad is your pain? Do you have weakness? Do you have numbness? Do you have tingling? Can you sort of get by with what you have while, while your body does the rest of the work? So we'll use non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. We'll use a short period of rest. We no longer really recommend weeks and weeks of bed rest because that actually makes patients worse. So we usually recommend you take a couple days off of school or work, whatever you do, and then try to get back walking and doing light activity. Sometimes we'll do injections around the nerve root that's being pressed on by the disc herniation to try to decrease the inflammation. Uh, and therapy sometimes can help as well. And then if your symptoms are just too bad or you, you know, too severe, the nerve root injection's not helping, you really can't live that way because it can be a very excruciating pain, then sometimes we'll recommend surgery. And this is both for adults as well as adolescents. Uh, and surgery can be very successful, especially in the adult population. These are some of the happiest patients that we have. In orthopedics, after you do surgery, uh, usually patients don't like you very much in the recovery room because you've broken one of their bones or done something kind of painful to them initially you know, for the ultimate good, but three months down the line. So in the recovery room, they're not necessarily so happy. The uh, exception to that are uh, microdiscectomy patients. So these are patients who have had leg pain for a while. You take the disc out and all of a sudden their leg pain's gone and they wake up in the recovery room ecstatic because they're finally pain free. So in the right uh, setting with the right indications, this can be a very successful surgery. Now, it's important to know that both in adults as uh, well as in adolescents, there's a high reoperation rate and a little bit higher in kids than in adults, up to 28%. So almost 30% of patients have to undergo another surgery, usually because of a recurrent disc herniation. So you've got a little hole, some disc material squirts out. You take what's been squirted out, but there's still that hole, and you still have a lot of disc material, and so it'll still squirt out. And we've looked at trying to repair the hole, trying to take out more of the disc, all these things, and nothing really changes that reoperation rate. So it's just something that we kind of accept, tell patients about ahead of time, and use that as part of the discussion as to what uh, treatment we're going to go forward with. So apophyseal fractures or uh, apophyseal ring fractures are sometimes called. Again, this is sort of a disc herniation equivalent in the growing spine. Many times it's seen with a disc herniation. So a little bit of disc will come out as well, that bit of bone through the growth plate. And it's a little tough to see on the MRI, but basically, I don't know if I have a pointer, it's not going to work yet. So this black line here is the end plate. And you see how then it's gray here and the black lines there. So basically, they've sheared off a little bit of the end plate. Very similar symptoms, because again, it's a compression on the nerve root that's going by that disc. Uh, but the natural history for this isn't as favorable, because it's a little bit harder, harder for the body to eat up that bone. And so we tend to recommend surgery more frequently for an apophyseal ring fracture, because patients aren't necessarily going to get better. So unless they get better very quickly, then we're usually a little bit more uh, willing to say, all right, well, let's treat it with surgery and get you back on the road to recovery sooner because the chances that nature takes care of it are lower. So it's important to use uh, kind of an algorithmic approach uh, since 80% of the time we can't find a patient's back pain and we give it names like nonspecific back pain, mechanical low back pain, musculoskeletal back pain, or adult style low back pain is what I tend to call, call it since parents can kind of relate to that, which is you've got it, it's not due to anything that's gonna kill you, there's not too much that we can do that's gonna fix it quickly and so kind of welcome to adulthood. It's not the, the answer that people want to hear necessarily, but it's the truth. And so if we use this alg algorithmic approach and really only uh, work up patients who have red flags or specific uh, symptoms that are, correlate with a spondylolysis, a spondylolisthesis, a disc herniation, that sort of thing, and that's something that we can find while just talking to a patient and examining them. Otherwise, we recommend not working up every case of back pain because we'll be exposing kids to unnecessary radiation, doing x-rays when they're not going to show anything, putting them through MRIs when they don't need it. And I will tell you that I have yet to have a patient who underwent an MRI who said, that was so fun, can I do it again? I'm like, nobody likes an MRI. We try to play movies for the kids and make it as fun as possible. They still hate it. Uh, lab work, nobody likes to get a needle stick. So, you know, we're trying to make sure we don't miss anything, treat children appropriately, but at the same time, not put them through the ringer when we know it's not gonna tell us anything. 
Any question on some of the diagnoses of what it can be? All right, moving on. So back pain and backpacks, hot topic, theoretically. All right, so we know that backpacks are getting heavier. Uh, some schools remove their lockers for safety concerns, drug concerns, et cetera. S class sizes are increasing. School campuses are, are staying the same size, so there may be an insufficient number of lockers. Some schools are giving kids less time between classes, so they don't have time to go to their locker to get their books. People are carrying musical instruments, sports equipment. You know, Again, iPhone, iPad, computer, 80,000 things loaded up on their back. And we're seeing this increase in back pain, uh, or excuse me, um, backpack weight at the same time that we're also maybe seeing this increase in back pain. So the natural question is, are heavier backpacks to blame for these increasing rates of back pain? And I'll skip to the point, which is we don't know. There's a lot of research into this topic and basically an equal number of articles on either side of the coin. So there are some articles supporting that a heavy backpack is causing back pain. Other articles saying, no, there's no relationship. Uh, and the studies vary basically in the group that they're studying. You know, are they uh, uh, high school students? Are they elementary students? Do they live in California? Do they live in Nigeria? various things, uh, how they're asking the question about back pain. So is it uh, that the patient has come into their doctor complaining of it? Or is that we're asking them if they have any back pain? And then one of my favorite quotes by Mark Twain, he's a great uh, guy, many quotable quotes. Uh, but one of my favorites is that there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. So. Uh, you know, we tend, especially in medicine, to really hang our hat on the statistical significant p-value. So basically saying that the uh, relationship that we're trying to prove is more than chance. So A happened because of B, and it's more than chance that that just happened. So we tend to really hang our hat on that and say, aha, this is proof that A causes B, when really you can kind of manipulate the numbers and make all sorts of things happen. So these are just a few examples kind of highlighting how we can get different answers. So David Skaggs and his group at the Children's Hospital of LA, they do a lot of great research, published this in the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics uh, in 2006. And they looked at over 1,500 children in the Los Angeles area aged 10 to 15 years. And they actually asked kids a question when they came in for their school screening for scoliosis. They, they basically did a side study asking about back pain. And they gave a survey of nine questions. Do you use a backpack almost every school day, yes or no? In the backpack that you have now, is that about the same weight that you regularly carry, heavier, lighter, or the same? Do you usually carry it with one or two straps? Do you use a belt around your waist? Do you have back pain? How bad is your back pain on a scale of one to 10? Does it limit your activities in any way? Do you have to take any medicine for it? And do you think that the backpack you're carrying causes your back pain or makes it worse? So they're really trying to kind of elucidate how many kids have back pain and how severe it is. And what they found is that 97 kids carried backpacks. So basically, everybody carried backpacks. Nobody's really doing the roller suitcase anymore as much as we would love it, the messenger bag, et cetera. You know, backpacks are kind of the mainstay. And 37% of patients uh, with a backpack reported having back pain, with 82% of those saying that they had pain felt that it was uh, the backpack either caused it or made it worse. Now, they didn't have enough non-backpack users to really compare whether the backpack in and of itself causes pain, because the numbers were too small to get to the statistical significance. Uh, but they did note, and that's what the bar graph shows here, that the increasing weight of the backpack was associated with an increased frequency of patients reporting back pain. In addition, having access to a locker was associated with a lower rate of back pain than if a patient did not have access or if a kid did not have access. So that's 25% if you could get to your locker versus 39% if you could not get to a locker. So their conclusions, you know, they're uh, smart people, so they don't hang everything on their statistics, and so they don't say a heavy backpack causes back pain. But they do say that patients should be allowed access to lockers, or kids should be allowed uh, access to lockers, and that we should try to keep our backpacks lighter to try to decrease the risk of back pain. Now contrast that with a study um, by Wall, uh, who I believe is in Idaho, also published in the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics in 2003. And he took a very different approach. So rather than going out to the school and asking kids, hey, 
do you have back pain? Do you carry backpack? Do you think it causes it? He looked at 100 consecutive patients uh, from a larger cohort seen by him for back pain between the ages of eight to, from seven to 18 years. So these are kids who are actually showing up to the doctor and specifically to the pediatric orthopedist, or sort of that subspecialist with back pain. And so he asked those patients, called them up on the phone and said, mm, how bad's your back pain? What do you think makes it better? What do you think makes it worse? And do you think that your backpack contributed to it? So of those patients, 80% use backpacks to carry their books. So maybe messenger bags are cooler in Idaho, I don't know. Uh, and only three of the 100 patients reported that the back pain was made worse by the backpack. The rest, uh, physical activity was the most common exacerbating factor. So doing athletics or moving around a lot made it worse. But also no answer, so nothing made it better or worse, sitting or lying down. So his conclusion was that backpacks, heavy backpacks, are not uh, causing a significant increase in back pain. And the title of the article is actually Back Pain in Backpacks, Where's the Epidemic? Because there was sort of, for a while, this big brouhaha about how heavy backpacks were causing he uh, back pain. And so he sort of said, hey, wait, when we really look at what the impact is, you know, how severe this pain is for a patient to come and, and seek treatment, that doesn't necessarily pan out. Now, some studies uh, do show uh, objective alterations in gait, posture, and metabol metabolic parameters. So for example, there's an increased forward trunk lean if you have a load that's 15 to 20% of the body weight versus zero or 10%. So if you have a light load, you stand up nice and straight. If you have a heavier load, and we all do this, you lean forward to kind of bear that weight. In addition, there's a higher metabolic cost with uh, a child carrying a load 20% of their body weight versus zero or 10%. So you work harder when you got a heavier backpack. Uh, but the question is, does, do these objective parameter changes really translate into clinically significant back pain? And I think that the uh, question is still unanswered. So in my, pain, my opinion, I think that back pain is too multifactorial to really be able to ever definitively prove or disprove a causal relationship between pain and backpack weight or usage. My sort of feeling or gestalt is that having a really heavy backpack probably does make your back hurt a little bit more when you're wearing it, but that that doesn't mean that you have a debilitating back condition caused by your back pain. It's just like, you know, I carried my heavy purse over from clinic and towards the end of the walk, I'm like, oh, my shoulder kind of hurts because my bag is heavy, but when I put it down, I feel fine. But if somebody asked me after I walked over here, hey, did your shoulder hurt from your bag? I would say, yeah, it does. So we don't know to be honest, but our current recommendations of both the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics is to try to buy the lightest weight backpack you can, so don't make things heavier by having a heavy backpack. Try to keep the weight of it less than 15% of your child's body weight. Use two well-padded shoulder straps, lightly tightened, or well-tightened, I should say, to really distribute the load evenly. And then, probably not too cool in the high school, uh, but try to use the waist belt to, again, sort of evenly distribute the load so it's not all just hanging off the shoulders. So, unfortunately, we don't really know the answer. But we'll move on to preventive measures, which, again, we don't really know the answer, but I'll give you my two cents. So what can we as parents do to help our kids? Uh, I think that we want to stay as fit uh, as we can, but don't overdo it with one specific sport. So I think cross-training is great in general, uh, helps with overuse, can help core strength. I think it builds um, flexibility, adaptability. I think kids maybe like their sport better when they're doing a couple different sports uh, during a particular year. Uh, and I think it can definitely help with overuse uh, pain, including back pain. This is a totally biased opinion, uh, since I do yoga myself for my chronic low back pain from 15 years of gymnastics. Uh, but consider doing a little specific core strengthening, either yoga, Pilates, swimming, that kind of thing. Research in adults uh, suggests that doing yoga for chronic and recurrent low back pain can improve both back function uh, as well as decrease pain. So, you know, I drink the yoga Kool-Aid. I fully recognize my own bias. So take that with a serious grain of salt. And then listen to your child. Remember those red flags, the night pain, the constant pain, ridiculous pain down the legs, fever, malaise. You know, you know your child if they're just punky and not quite themselves, then get it worked up. Talk to your pediatrician. And then also think about other things that may be impacting a child's expression of pain, of back pain. 
there's clear evidence in both the adult as well as the pediatric literature that there's a significant role of psychological distress as well as adverse psychosocial factors in reports of back pain as well as other somatic complaints like headaches, migraines, uh, stomach aches, etc. So if a kid's getting bullied at school and doesn't want to do PE, they might manifest that not, not intentionally, not consciously, but that may be manifested as pain. So always kind of keep that in mind and you know, know your kid, talk to them, have honest discussions with them, and really try to uh, put the whole picture together as it may be related. So my final sort of summary statement is that low back pain and back pain in general in children is not as uncommon as we once thought it was, but it's not uh, quote unquote too bad most of the time. So most kids forget that they ever had it. Most kids do not uh, um, have a decreased quality of life because of it. Uh, it does not consistently predispose a child to problems as an adult. So just because you have an episode of back pain as a kid doesn't mean that you're going to have chronic back pain as an adult. And then there's some uh, sort of question is that is, is having back pain just a, a matter of walking on two feet? Is some intermittent back pain a function of being human? Uh, we don't know. Certainly we want to all lead active pain-free lives as best we can, um, but there may be some things that are out of our control. That's it. Thank you.